Good morning to you, Shiloh. Good morning. And to those who are in the net, if you are watching, if you are listening, we welcome you all this morning to our service. Uh, I'm here to give you a scripture and a prayer. Our scripture this morning will come from Psalms, 90, Psalms 99, verses 1 through 5, and it's coming from the Common English Version of the Bible. And if you don't mind standing for the reading of the word. Our Lord, you are king. You rule from the throne above the winged creatures as people tremble and the earth shakes. You are praised in Zion and you control all nations. Only you are God and your power alone so great and fearsome is worthy of praise. You are our mighty king, a lover of fairness who sees the justice is done everywhere in Israel. And our Lord, our God, we praise you and kneel down to worship you, the God of holiness. May God add a blessing to the hearers and the doers of his word. May we bow for a word of prayer. Father and our God, we come now this morning. Father God, once again, you have delivered us unto your sanctuary. Father, we ask now that we would clean ourselves up as we go into this service, Father God, that you would be able to plant seeds, Father God, that would continue to grow us, that someone else might see what you're doing in us, that we might be a testimony for you. We thank you now, Master. And as we go through this service, Father God, we ask you to be with us and guide us. Let us hear your word, Father God, but not only hear, but be doers of your word. We bless you, Father God. We ask you, Father God, for those that are here on the sound of my voice, that you would allow them to join in this morning with praise and worship. We know in some situations it's been a rough week. In some situations, Father God, there has been victories. But Lord, we know that you're God through it all. And we thank you. We bless you. These things we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How many people are excited to be in the house of the Lord? Is anybody expecting great things? Is anybody expecting great things from God? We expect God to do great things. Come on, give God a hand praise in this place. And I don't know about you, but I'm expecting the great.
Lord, the blessing is on you. Say the blessing is on you. Bless in the city, bless in the field. Bless when I come and when I go. The blessing is on me. I'm expecting great things from you this morning. Listen, does anybody know Jesus in this place? I mean, do you really know Jesus? That time when there's nobody else around, you're, you're trying to call, nobody else to call. It's just that moment, that quietness, and it's like, I've heard about you. So I'm calling on you, God, will you come through? Will you find a place? The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, that you shall be saved. So this morning, we just want to know if you know Jesus. And if not, he wants to live inside your heart. And if you do know Jesus, we want to rekindle that relationship. We want to just honor him and worship him in this place. Anybody know Jesus in this place? I don't know about you, but I'm glad to know him. He's a friend of mine. Let's sing it again. Ooh, when the song is over. simple if you don't know the Lord all you have to do is confess it with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord that God raised him from the dead you could be saved he's a great friend to know a great person come on let's just tell the congregation say say confess him with your mouth believe him in your heart believe him in your heart do you know Jesus you can know Jesus you can know Jesus in your heart Confess him, confess him with your mouth. Believe him in your heart. Believe him in your heart. Do you know Jesus? You can know. You can know Jesus in your heart. Confess him, take. Confess him with your mouth. Believe him in your heart. You can know Jesus. Confess him with your mouth. Confess him with your mouth. Believe him in your heart. Believe him in your heart. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus in your heart? 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 Do you know Jes
to know Jesus. It's so good to know Jesus. Hey. Songs that say, what a friend we have in Jesus. All my sin. All because we do not care. Beloved, if you don't mind turning your Bibles to Psalm 63. This is the last corn to put in the jukebox. Since we had a mix going on, it landed on Psalm 63. You have Psalm 63, say amen. I want to read in your hearing from the English Standard Version of the Bible. Allow me, uh, please be patient with me. Allow me to read it in its entirety. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. For those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword, and they shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. Father in heaven, I thank you for the opportunity to stand again. When just last week I was lying down, you are a good God and you are a healer and a way maker and a deliverer. And our hearts are open to you. And as we think about you, even in the midst of our personal challenges, we find it within ourselves to praise your holy name. And I ask even now, God, that you would arrest our, our attention long enough to speak to us. And God, come now in power and might that your word might go forth and that the breakthrough that is needed will take place and that transformation will happen in our lives. Be glorified, oh God. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. In Christ Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. This morning, I want to talk to you about trusting in a tried God. 
trusting in a tried God. I do want to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you who have been praying for me as I have uh, been in recovery mode. And uh, I'm just glad that God has given me another chance to make it through uh, uh, this thing called SARS-CoV-2, a.k.a. COVID-19. And uh, I am grateful to be back in the saddle again. want to send a great big God bless you to uh, Minister Detrick Heron for serving in my stead on last week, sharing with you uh, out of the Psalms. All right, um, let, let's, let's get started. Let's get started as we wrap up and conclude this series entitled Jukebox. We've been playing some of the greatest hits from the middle of the Bible. And if you have not been encouraged to trust more and lean more into the Lord, well, I don't know where you've been. But let's get started. Trusting in a tried God. I want to share with you a story I came across about a guy by the name of Bob Vernon who, who was um, a trainer at the Los Angeles Police Department. He is, he is a part of perhaps one of the most celebrated police agencies in the nation. LAPD is one of the most celebrated police agencies in the country. Regardless to all of that other stuff, they are one of the most celebrated police agencies in the nation. And he was a trainer, and so one of the things that they would do as they would train young recruits, they would give them their life uh, their their uh, their vest, their bulletproof vest. They would give they they would issue them their bulletproof vest. What they would do before they would even have them to put it on and wear it um, during training, so that they would be comfortable when they actually got on patrol. They would take this bulletproof vest and they would place it on a mannequin. And so when they placed this bulletproof vest on this mannequin, what they would do is they would stand around and they would fire several rounds into the bulletproof vest. And so the recruits would, would watch and they would look. And after they had fired several rounds, perhaps emptying several clips in it, then they would invite them to go and inspect the mannequin. And in every case, when they inspected the mannequin, they would determine that no bullet had actually gotten to the mannequin. In other words, the bulletproof vest held up under fire. <clears throat> and so... He would then invite them to put the vest on and give them an opportunity to stand while someone shoots into the vest again. And you already know the end of that. Nobody volunteered. Nobody volunteered. But his logic was simply this. He wanted them to to take away from that experience that they could trust in the gear that had been issued to them because they had seen it work for themselves so that when they were on the streets and someone would begin to shoot at them, they would not worry if their gear would hold up. What I'm trying to tell you is that as believers in God through Jesus Christ, that we ought to be in a position where we trust in our God because our God has been tried and has passed the test. And yet, the reality is that most of us still struggle with trusting in a tried God. 
We, we, we watch God do some amazing things in the lives of our friends, amazing things in the lives of our parents. We have stories that we can tell on how God has brought somebody else through. But still, after all of that, we still struggle with trusting that God will be faithful when we need him the most. Am I talking to anybody in here that you can just testify today that if you're not too ashamed to admit it, that you believe God more for others than you believe God for yourself at times? That God can do miracles, but he can do it for other people in other places at other times. But I stop by to tell you that David wants to teach us that our God is so faithful that he can bless us right here, right now, and at this very place. This, too, is a psalm that reflects the season when David had been pushed out and exiled in, uh, of the kingdom when his own son, Absalom, had run him off. We find David now has been abandoned and cut off from family, his closest advisors, his friends, and he was, he was seeing people defect and run away and run off on him one after another. He was suffering from isolation and rejection because of the lying lips of those who had turned against him. He has nowhere to run besides the wilderness. It's, it is there in the wilderness that the king discovers a deeper relationship with God without, without all of the accoutrements of the palace. Can I just tell you today, beloved, that there will be a season where life is going to force you out of your comfortable place and you will find yourself doing things you said you'd never do, hanging with people you said you'd never hang with, and you'll end up at a low point in life that you'll never never have seen yourself going to. And it's at that moment that you're going to have to remember the same God that you praised in the palace, you're going to have to learn how to praise him in the wilderness. Most of us, our praise is conditional. It depends on how we feel and what's going on. And I want to tell you today that if your praise is conditional, maybe your deliverance will be conditional. But if you are willing to praise God, no matter what is going on in your life, you might discover that God knows how to show up in the middle of the worst moments of your life when all hope is lost, when you don't think nobody cares. God will show up and be for you what none other can be. Everything that they took with them, God knows how to show up and replace it. I just made my own self happy. The things that people think that they're withholding for you, that when you praise God, when they take it, God knows how to give it back to you and then some. Is there anybody in here? That know what I'm talking about. You trusted God. And when you trusted God, it seemed like it is at the moment that you trusted God that everything went to heck in a handbasket. And the people that you counted on took their little ball and jacks and left. But then God showed up and began to make a way out of no way. God showed up and began to heal. God showed up and began to deliver. God showed up and began to give you a renewed sense of hope and belonging and peace when it seemed like every storm that ever was had come your way God showed up and declared 
that he would be your shelter in a time of storm. Let me go on. Y'all trying to push me too fast. You know I'm part of the sick and shedding crowd. Let me just take my time. There are four things I want to share with you today. And then I'll be out of your way. Let you go bounce house and eat a hot dog or whatever. The first thing I believe Psalm 63 wants to teach us is that we need to learn how to emulate or mimic or copy David's desire for God. Uh-huh. Watch this. It's right there in the text. Oh God, you are my God. Watch this. I earnestly seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. That's what the text says. Watch this. To be able to say, my God, by faith, transformed, watch this, David's wilderness experience into a worship experience. There in the desert. He was hungry and thirsty. But his deepest desire was spiritual, not physical. With his whole being, body, and soul, he yearned for God's satisfying presence. Seems like this is a throwback to, to Psalm 42, where he talks about as the deer pants for the water brook, so does my heart pant for you or long for you. Watch this. He, he, he is desiring God where? In the wilderness. Can I tell you something, beloved? Anybody can hope for God and desire God when everything is good. Don't take much faith to worship when everything is well. But the question that begs to be asked and answered is can you worship God when life has forced you in to your own personal wilderness? How did David acquire this wonderful spiritual appetite? He did it because he had spent some time worshiping his God in the sanctuary. He had erected a tent at Mount Zion and returned, watch this, returned the ark to his rightful place. And he had found great delight in going there and contemplating God. Because he didn't belong to the tribe of Levi. David couldn't enter into the sanctuary proper. But from his study of the law, he knew the design and the assigned rituals. And he understood their deeper meaning. My brothers and sisters, it is our regular and consistent worship that prepares us for moments of crisis. Don't sleep on what I just told you. It's when you are in what seems to be pedestrian moments like this. It's when you are just doing what you know to do, just showing up to the sanctuary that you are building up some power and some strength and some fortitude and some courage because when you come to the house of God and you worship him corporately and sincerely when you get out there and life begins to kick you in the seat of your pants you can remember the faithfulness of God that you experienced in the sanctuary and you can turn your own private hell into an opportunity to worship the God who will be faithful Faithful under every circumstance. That's why you ought to not take 
worship for granted. Don't come up in here, sitting up in here like you got it all together, like you can do it better. Just go for yours. Don't look over to the side wondering what other people are doing. Just go for yours. Come with your own praise. Come with your own thanksgiving. Think, come with your own shout. Come with your own dance. Come with your own hallelujah. Remembering that God will be faithful. I don't care what nobody else came to do. I came to praise the Lord. I show up every Sunday. Like Moses showed up in Exodus 33 and 18 where he says to the Lord, just show me your glory. My brothers and my sisters, if I don't get anything else, I just want the Lord to show me his glory. I just want to see his glory manifested in my life and in my family and in my church and in my community. I just want to see the Lord's glory. I don't need another car. I don't need another. I don't need another suit. I don't need another house. I just want your glory. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? That if you could just have some of his glory, that if he could just share some of his glory with you, that if he can share some of his glory with you, even when you don't have enough money, if he just show his glory. When your heart has been broken and, 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 and the country that you love seems to break your heart. And, and when it seems like the government don't care, if he can just show me his, his glory, I believe I can make it. When, when I lost my loved one and they've been my partner for decades and, and when I don't know how I'm going to make it, if, if, if I could just see a bit of his glory, I, I can make it. And, and when my friends betray me and, and I'm left all alone to fight for myself, if I could just see a bit of his, I believe I can make it. Is there anybody in here that the only reason you made it is because the Lord let you see him come down in your circumstance in midday splendor? Just show me your glory. Throughout the annals of time, there has been this sliding scale of the seven wonders of the world. I'm sure at any given time there are more than seven, but that has been the phrase that has been coined throughout history. And in the ancient East, there were these seven wonders of the world, the great pyramids of Giza, with their intricacy and engineering uh, mastery. Some even speculate that aliens had to have erected them. But no, it was people of the ebony hue. Maybe even the hanging gardens of Babylon where you can get fruit, vines, and trees that bear fruit all in the same hanging gardens. Maybe... The four, the four uh, story statue of the Greek god Zeus at Olympia, or the temple of Artemis at Ephesus, or the mausoleum of Halicarnassus, or the Colossus of Rhodes, or the lighthouse of Alexander, both which point the way to seafaring men safe harbor but out of all of those wonders in the world there is nothing more wonderful than the lord's glory when it is when it is available to those who will trust in him because they know that he is tried and true david teaches us how to yearn for god even in the wilderness some of us know what the wilderness feels like don't we where you work and work and it still seems like 
you have more month than money. That's the wilderness. When you've invested in sacrifice and prayed over and prayed with and prayed for a child and they still have an attitude and they can't seem to get their situation together and it seems like as much as you give them, the more that they take and waste, that's the wilderness. When you struggle to try to keep your relationship together and it falls apart anyway, that's the wilderness. When you get followed around in the store just because you look different and that's not about color, that's more about class, that's the wilderness. When you have education but still don't have opportunity, that's the wilderness. And what David wants us to know is that whenever you find yourself in the wilderness, break out in worship. Because David wants us to know, if you ever try him, you'll learn how to trust him. Here it is. Not only ought we to emulate David's desire, but we need to observe David's dependence on God. Watch this, verses 3 through 5. I won't read it in the interest of time, but you see it in your Bible. We need to depend on the Lord, don't we? David didn't depend on the tabernacle or its furnishings. And I remember growing up, let me just, this is not in my notes, but let me just give you an aside here. I, I remember growing up, you better not put your hand or lean on that communion table. Some, some mother, some deacon will beat you up and tackle you. Because they acted like it was more power in that piece of wood than it was in the Lord. But David teaches us how to depend not on the temp tabernacle and his furnishing, but he teaches us how to depend on the Lord. Watch, watch this. He trusted in the living God whose character and works were declared by those furnishings. Unlike the superstitious people of Judah in Jeremiah's day, David looked beyond the material objects and saw the spiritual realities. He had no priest or altar there, but he could lift his hands like the priest and bless the Lord and his people. His uplifted hands, though holding no sacrifice, signified his prayer and the love of his uplifted heart. By faith, he was under the wings of the cherubim in the Holy of Holies, protected from his foes. Now, he's not there. But when you worship God in the wilderness, you can transform any place into a sanctuary. I know what I'm talking about. I know you know too. Some of you have transformed your cube into a worship place. Some of you transformed your bus or your truck into a worship place. Some of you transformed your cash register into an altar and had worship right there. You ought to come to church, but you can talk to them when you ain't in the church. Shucks, here it is. It's there in that wilderness. That he had no sacrificial meal to enjoy, but his soul feasted on the spiritual delicacies that even the priests were not permitted to eat. No wonder those old saints, I can see my, my grandmother at St. Luke on Dietering. They used to sing all of those 100s. That's not how they said it. They said 100. Oh, one hundreds, and I can I can hear them as it echoes 
in the tables of my soul now. Guide me, O thy great Jehovah. And when it really got good to him, I could hear him ring out, bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. That's what David is talking about. He has become satisfied in the Lord. He says that it is, my soul is satisfied as if I've eaten the best food that the land has to offer. You know how you feel when, you, when you've gone to Papa's Brothers and got that ribeye? Oh, I'm talking about me. And when you get done and you top it off with that turtle pie, look, stick a fork in me, I'm done because my body is satisfied. But David says, I got spiritual food in my worship that when I'm done, stick a fork in me, I'm satisfied. That's why you don't have to wait till Sunday. That's why you don't have to wait till you touch, touch down on 4702 Saturn Road. Just worship him wherever you are. Have I got a witness? Listen, David, David wants to teach us something. That as we depend on him, we ought to learn how to just thank God for God. See, most of us don't thank God until we have a thing to thank him for. But we got to learn how to thank God just for God. Just for God being God. He was God when he healed you. He was God when he saved you. He was God when he set you free. He was God when he kept watch over you. He was God when you didn't have a dime. But he made a way for you. He was God when your heart was broke. But you was able to stand up in the house. He was God when they left you, but he kept you warm in the night. He was still God. That's why you got to learn how to thank God for just being God. Shucks, man, here it is. Learn how to depend on him. But then, I love David. Not that the the moniker of David is that he's the man after God's own heart. I love him because he demonstrates why. Because of his devotion. That's the third thing I want to tell you. We got to check out David's devotion to God. Verse 6 and 7, watch this. Listen to what David says. He says, when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. Watch this. That's David's devotion. Can I, can I preach it like I feel it? Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Now, you would think that with all of the trouble that David's got going on, that the reason why David is lying on his bed thinking through the watches of the night, and there was three of them, that you would think that David is lying on his bed because he's too worried to sleep. He's too worried to sleep. Now watch this. David is actually at peace in the middle of turmoil. Don't, don't miss that. David is at peace in a bad time. Okay, okay. All right, session. Okay, can can you say it another way? Cause they're not getting it. Can you? Tr okay, try it again. Okay. Life was kicking David's tail, but David was still cool about it. See, because what happens with most of us when life starts to grab us around our neck, we got to go and drink it off. Creep it off. Smoke it off. Because we want to escape the pressure that we are under. David says, do what I do. With, instead of lying awake worrying, 
I'm going to lie awake and worship. But look at how he does it. Look at how he does it. He does it by remembering how faithful God had already been. Don't, don't, okay, okay, let me, let, me, let me illustrate it. Don't change my shot. Lead a shot there. Lead a shot there. Watch this. Here it is. David is far away from the palace and his own kingly chambers. He's in the wilderness where the moss and the grass is his duvet and the rock is his pillow. And the scorpion and the snake are his roommates. But in the midst of the wilderness, David is lying down thinking about how when he was young, though he's far away, he's thinking about when he was young, that when he was guarding his daddy's sheep, that, and the lion came, God gave him victory over the lion. And when the bear came, God gave him victory over the bear. And when he took his brothers their lunchables and Goliath was talking trash about his God, God gave him the victory over the giant. And when Saul tried to kill him and was throwing javelins at his head, God gave him a, a matrix blessing and he avoided the javelin and he was sustained and became not only the anointed king, but the appointed king. And God was faithful then. And every time David went out to war, they had victory. And though at some point in his spirit, he was away from the kingdom, but every time he thought about the goodness of God he thanked God for being faithful and he began to worship I wonder if there's anybody in here this morning that when you think of his goodness and all that he's done for you your soul cries out hallelujah you got to have Real devotion. That doesn't mean that things are not going to go right. But your devotion says, I'll still think about the goodness of God. Your devotion says, I'm still all in. Your devotion says, God, you can count on me. I won't give up. I won't give in. I will praise you. Let me get out of here. He says... He says that even in the midst of this, my soul cleaves to you. You know, that's the language of a husband and wife coming together. And the two shall become one. That's what David says, that in the watches of the night, when I think about your goodness and your faithfulness, we become one. Have I got a witness? Let me, let me, let me push on. Let me push on. Not only his desire... Not only his dependence, not only his devotion, but lastly, his deliverance. Uh, uh -huh. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Verses 8 through 11. You'll see in verse 8, I referenced just a few moments ago, my soul clings to you. Your upright hand upholds me. But then David goes into his imprecations where he's praying about the enemies. David was, was known to be a good head of state, but he was a horrible head of household. And his, many of his enemies come from his own lo loins and lineage, people who were close to him. He, he, he is now remembering them. And, and, and I'm not here to... to to proclaim superstition that you're not going to think about your problems. But David gives us a pattern to learn how to turn over your problems to the Lord. Because God can do more with your enemies than, he could ever, than you could ever do. Can I help you? See, what we want to do is destroy our enemies. But sometimes... God will transform our enemies and our enemies might become our strongest allies. Oh God, watch this. 
Watch this. Watch this. Da David gives his imprecation. He, he, put, he prays and he, he, rem he tells the Lord all about it. But you got to remember when David is praying these, this kind of prayer, he, he's, he's not trying to turn God into some kind of guard dog where he's sicking God on people. David is really advocating and standing up for the righteousness and the holiness of God. And what they were doing were outside of the will of God. And David advocates for the righteousness because he wants to be in right relationship with God. So when you are talking to God about your problems and about the people that got on your last chocolate or vanilla nerves, remember that the very people you're talking about are God's children too. Or am I talking to anybody? And don't forget that just how you can tell God on somebody, somebody can tell God on you. I didn't come to tell you that, but I think you ought to know it. Watch this, watch this. And, and, and so throughout time, you, you've had people to criticize David for wanting his enemies to be handled. But I just told you David was, was protecting and was standing up for the righteousness and the holiness of God. He wants us to be reminded of the holiness of God. See, my brothers and sisters, what we need to understand is that when we surrender our lives and when we worship in our own wilderness, God will uphold us with his powerful right hand. That God is faithful to protect us from the enemy and that God will deliver us. Too often what we want God to do is that we want God, I'm slowing down because I want you to get what I'm about to say. What, what we want God to do is to change everything around us and leave us alone. Now, let me cut, block this light so I can see you. We, we want God to change everything around us and leave us alone. Can I tell you that if God transforms everything around you and leave you just like you are, you will be a mess in a miracle. And whatever you want to do, God, to transform me, whatever you want to use to make me more like you, God, have your way because what I don't want to be is a mess in a miracle. He delivers David. David goes on to have a decent career because not perfect, but respectable. And we got to learn how to trust in the Lord because it's not going to always end up perfect. See, often what we have in our minds is that in 22 minutes and a couple of commercials, we'll go through all of the conflict and resolve it by the end of the show. And the truth of the matter is, some of us are going to get off of this ride with some stuff still left undone. But we're going to have to trust that when God shows up, God delivers us to the extent that we need to be delivered to become and to do what he's assigned us to do. And we got to learn how to give God some praise in the middle of that. I wonder if I have just about 10 or 15 of y'all that know that where you are is not where you're going to end up, but you're trusting God until you get there. That you don't want to be a mess in a miracle. And so you're opening your heart saying, God, have your way. David was in a mess, but then God worked through him a miracle. And listen, I'd rather be a miracle in a mess than a mess in a miracle. Ah, uh, because if I'm a mess in a miracle, God can still work through me. God can still pull the strings. God can still move the levers. God can still make my enemies my footstool. Am I talking to anybody in here? God, have your way in my life. I want to desire you like David. I want to worship you in my wilderness. I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to get on the heliphone. I'm just going to start worshiping. Is there anybody who's going through something right 
right now. I double dog dang you to start praising God right now. Begin to worship him. Begin to thank him for the breakthrough, for the deliverance, for the healing, and watch God show up in your life. Because if you really had a problem, you'd be worshiping. If you was really going through something, you'd be worshiping. If you really experienced some lack, you'd be worshiping. Because you know that you can trust in a tried God. How many times have he come through for you? How many times have he made a way? How many times has he healed you? How many times have he fought your battles? How many times have he lifted up a bow down head? How many times have he given you joy in your sorrow? God can be trusted. Hallelujah. 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 I thank you for the sunshine and the rain. I thank you for the sickness and the pain. I thank you when I have a little and I thank you when I have a lot because faithful is our God. Faithful is our God. Faithful is our God. Faithful is our God. Holy God, our Father, you've just been too good for us to just sit on our hands like you're not good. Transform our thinking so we'll never ever get comfortable with complaining in the wilderness. But rather, God, we'll learn how to worship you in the wilderness. Things don't have to go our way for us to worship you. It's not contingent on things going perfect. It's based on you being faithful. David's life teaches us that when the the most stinking disappointments present themselves in our lives. Not to give up, but rather to hold on all the more to our faith. Now, Father, save alive those who should be saved, whether in the sanctuary or virtually, those who are watching now, those who may watch later transform their lives give them peace that surpasses all human understanding and give them that at one meant with you and you bring them into the family of God where they have been forgiven and set free bring them close to you Lord save them from the fowler's snare the enemy wants to destroy them and defeat them and cause them to be depressed. But David's life shows us that you are a strong deliverer. That's why we worship you. You tried. You've taken more bullets than that vest and still, you still hold up. For those that know you but don't have a place to call home, whether they're in the sanctuary or virtually, I pray right now, Father, that they will trust in the God that we proclaim and that they will connect. They will connect and believe that they have a place here, whether they are in the city or whether they are across the country. They have a place family of the Shiloh Church for those God who just need prayer just they've been fighting the wilderness along for so long that they're weary and they just need someone to step in and pray with them and pray for them Lord hear my send me let them know God that it'll be between me you and them 
Have your way. Have your way, O oh Lord. And then, God, because you've called us to serve this present age, we thank you in advance for the abundance of giving that will take place because, God, you know somebody's soul depends on us being what you've called us to be. Help us to reach out into the community and, and do the work you've assigned our hands to do. Somebody is waiting to hear that Jesus saved. Somebody is waiting to see the love of Christ in tangible ways, whether it's through food or clothing or health, resources being brought to them. Whatever it is, God, they are waiting. So put it in our hearts to step up and do what you call us to do. We love you. We thank you. Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. Come on, give him some praise. I want to share. I want to share a, a, a couple of things with you to, today, and then I'm going to share some other things with you next week. Uh, but today, I want to share with you, I want to, uh, uh, September 17th, September 17th, we're going to have a church-wide workshop. Amen. We're going to have a church-wide workshop September 17th from 9 a.m. to 1. We're going to have some food here for you. We want you to come out. You don't have to be a leader to come out. In fact, I want everybody to come out. Definitely leaders, but I want everyone to come out because now is the time to get back on the on the horse and ride so we're going to cast vision again we're going to have some uh some speakers some from within some from without and we're going to solidify some things we're about to reorganize some things and we need your help i'm telling you in enough time so that you can make it <clears throat> so that you can put it on your calendar and you can come on time and stay the whole time. Cause, because I, I've been here 11 years. I know how you do. Because what y'all will do is one of y'all will look across the room at the other. And before I know it, when I dip, you dip, we dip. <laughs> but I need you to stay. I need you to stay. We're going to reorganize. We're going to put in some new policies and procedures. From every area of our church, uh, HR, all the way down to... Um, well, I shouldn't say down, all the way across to social action um, programs. We're going to have about 12 to 14 committees. We want you to volunteer, and we are, we are sharing the ministry with the church. And so you don't have to sit around and, and critique anything. You will be a part of making it happen. Amen? Amen? All right. Um, it's real easy <laughs> to talk about what should have been done when you ain't doing that. In, in the words of another one of those hits, oops, that is. <laughs> so I need y'all to come out September 17th from 9 to 1. We have a lot to cover. It's going to be interesting, engaging. We're going to feed you. We're going to have to, so we need you to be faithful in your giving because we're going to have to bring some, some, uh, some speakers in. Everything that we need to do the work is in the house. 
but we also need other perspectives on how to do the work. Amen? All right. Now, um, because everybody don't have all the answers. Yeah. So we need to, we need to get some, some folks who are doing things well, and we want them to come and share. One of the things that I really want to challenge you on is how we conduct ourselves with one another. When people are trying to develop a relationship with the Lord through a local body, they need a few things. Clear instructions and access to information. A friendly environment. Huh? And supportive people who know the way. Are you with me? So, we want to do some things, but it's going to take all hands on deck to get there. Are you with me? All right. So now, September 17 from 9 till... Okay. All right. All right. Now, um, we need your help. All right. So be, be, be faithful and consistent in your giving. Um, you know I shared with you that... Our mortgage payment has gone up exponentially. Our insurance has gone up by thousands. Hey, man, we just got to do it. It's, we're in that season. Inflation is affecting a lot of things. And then some things were just bound to happen like our mortgage. So it's time for us to pull pull together. I, hey, I'm not telling you you can't go, go on vacation. Go on vacation and leave your tithe and your offering. I know what Creflo said, but giving is still right. Amen. Nobody's coming to save us. Amen. <laughs> we have to pitch in and do it together. Hey, listen, I love you. Thank you for praying for me and uh, sending out your concern. Uh, we're getting ready to go. Um, yeah, today, the um, back to school, school supply giveaway it's going to be happen, happening soon, so if you don't mind, if you have school supplies, make sure that they get it. Uh, if you're on the volunteer, make sure that you plug in uh, to make this event uh, as good as it can be. All right? All right. Come on, stand to your feet. We're getting ready to go. And, we, and we're leaving early, too. Get used to this mess. All right. Father in heaven, how we thank you for all that you said through song and sermon. And I pray, Father, that you would seal the word in our heart that as we leave this place, never from your presence, that we'll apply the truths to our lives. We need you, God. And so we will not try to uh, behave as if we don't. We're leaving here with a greater desire for you, more dependence on you, deeper devotion from you and expecting a greater deliverance from you. Now unto him who's able to keep us from falling, who's able to present us faultless before his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise Savior be glory and majesty, power and dominion both now and forever. Amen. God bless you. See you Wednesday at noon. This is John.